I'm going to need a little bit of time today, so I'm going to look at you. Thank you for that, by the way. Uh, I want to talk to every minister that's here, and I'm going to tell you this. The Holy Spirit is saying to you, find your audience. When I was a teenager, I was preaching in Chico, California, to a handful of people. And I thought I was an evangelist, so I wanted souls to get saved. I have since learned that the idea of soul winning is not anything but a deliberate act. Our crusades don't have attendance because I'm famous. They have attendance because we have an energized and well-trained army that goes into the ghetto and brings in the homeless and the lost. They are not in our meetings by accident. And you need to get right with God if you believe that people ought to be getting saved in your church. And you don't have any kind of training program that bring people in. Because you're, you're, at, you're, you're doing, you're tempting God is what you're doing. So here I was, a teenager, preaching in a church, and nobody was getting saved. And I had made the mistake of thinking if I prayed, people would get saved. Well, you have to pray, and as Yonggi Cho said, you obey after you pray. If you intercede and then don't expect directions, you're turning intercession into a license to not act. So prayer without expectancy is tempting God. And many churches have said, we're not into soul winning, we're into intercession. And I've said, no, you're not, because your intercession would have led to soul winning. It's inevitable. And if you're not even expecting your prayer to be answered, here's, here's what Jesus said. The harvest is great, labors are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he send workers into the harvest. Now, can you imagine praying that prayer? and not looking for that moment when the workers are going to go in. And that's, what's, that's why our crusades are working so well. People want to know our magic end. I have young preachers visit me, and I look at them and I think to myself, I'm not going to tell you anything, because you have no heart for truth. You just are looking for the magic bullet, the shortcut. What's, what's the gimmick and the hook? And I look at them, lit. it's hard work. It's obedience. It's a deliberate attempt to put a tent where nobody wants it, go get the people nobody else wants, bring them in, feed them, clothe them, and watch the power of God fall on them. Now, so many of you pastors have been told to change your message. That's a pile of garbage. Whoever told you to change your message was giving you an absolute lie from the enemy. Now watch, you can't want a big church. You can't want a lot of money. What you've got to want is to obey God Amen. and to say, it doesn't matter to me what the end result is of this obedience. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter who I end up with or how I end up with. I have to obey God, and that's all there is to it. Now, so I was preaching. Nobody was getting saved. The crowds are going down. I was in a tiny little Assembly of God church preaching. And so I made a rash vow to God because I was stupid and young. And I said to God, if no one gets saved tonight, I'm going to quit the ministry. Somebody's got to get saved tonight or I'm quitting. I even looked up a job in a restaurant and called him up and got the job just to show God, see, I mean it. <laughs> right? So now, that night, I'm staying at a Christian conference ground seven miles out of Chico. It was called uh, Springs of Living Water. I'm staying in this, hotel, this resort, and, uh, and I'm driving in, and I get ready to preach and it started raining, and it started torrentially raining. And I knew, I'm done, I'm gonna be in a restaurant. 
So I'm preaching, and the only people there are retired missionaries. So unless somebody backslides on the spot, I'm out. Nobody responded. Nobody came forward. I'm out of the ministry. I'm thinking, I, you know, now I knew how much I wanted to be a preacher now that I wasn't one. So I'm driving in the rain, hydroplaning my way back to this hotel. And there's a bridge, and the water's all the way up to the bridge. I'm talking to people in Fort Myers about high water. Like, you know what that is, Mario. And so I'm, the water is up to the bridge. I get over it. I get to my room, and I'm in my room alone, realizing that it's almost midnight. It's about 10.30 at night, and I'm out of the ministry. And I'm pacing my room, wondering if I did something stupid. which was equally stupid <laughs> to consider the fact that it was any possibility it wasn't stupid. <laughs> Approximately a quarter to midnight, the phone rings in my room. These were, for you millennials, it was called a landline. And the landline is ringing, and I pick it up. It is the last voice on earth that I thought I would ever hear. His name was Bob Cummings. And Bob was the guy in my high school who had the locker next to me. And he was a loudmouth atheist who tormented me. Now, I'm 200 miles from my high school. And he's calling me at a quarter to midnight. And I'm sitting there going, the devil gave you my number. <laughs> you're rubbing salt in my wounds right now. That's what you're doing. He said, Mario, it's Bob. I said, of course. And we're talking, and I'm listening, and I'm going, you know, this is just, you're, you know, you're backing up on a hit-and-run victim is what you're doing here. <laughs> and then he says what I could never, ever imagine him saying. He says, I didn't call you to harass you. He said, I'm in this hotel. And I heard you were here. And he said, I've been saved. Now, when he said that, it sounded over the phone like, <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to process that if Bob Cummings could be saved, anyone could be saved. But he said, I'm not even calling you to ask you to let you know that I've been saved. He said, I am a chaplain with the California Youth Authority. And the bridge is washed out for our evening devotional. I've got 35 uh, felons downstairs that are, that are drug addicts and gangsters, and they're supposed to get a Bible study, and I heard that you're a preacher. I was standing next to him while he was still talking to me on the phone. I ran downstairs. I had my Bible. I said, let's go. We got to go. We got to get there. I'm looking at the clock. It's like five minutes to midnight. I went in there and got the speed sermon. <laughs> there was no choice. All 35 got saved. All 35 got saved. Look, 
I didn't just get them saved. I said, every one of you got devils. Now you're going to be delivered. So whether they had a demon or not, I cast them out. I said, I don't care. Let's just be safe. And now I said, every one of you need the Holy Ghost. I said, step back, Bob. Fire of God is coming on these kids. And now they're filled with the Holy Spirit. People look at me now with what's happened to our ministry, and they go, man, you're an overnight success. And uh, I said, yeah, 50-year overnight success. And I, they go, what happened? And everyone that hears me preach today knows that I was saying the exact same things in the 80s, in the 90s. And, I, and he said, well, what happened? I said, preacher, quit coming around for the sake of the crowd. Make the crowd come around to your message." and stay faithful to your word. If God told you to preach holiness, brother, preach it. I'm not getting enough help here. Preach it. If God told you that you're supposed to lead people into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so what if the denominations have decided to stop doing it? So what if this guy is over here with the 12-minute express service that you can't tell when it's the word of God or a fortune cookie. Don't do it. Don't change. Don't compromise. Because when you stay true, God's going to bring the crowd to you.